Christian duty and panhandlers. What's the right thing to do? For a long time, I've struggled when approached by panhandlers, people on the street asking for money. I want to help, but I don't want to be taken advantage of or feed an addiction or endanger myself. As a Catholic, as a Christian, I know helping the less fortunate is central to my faith. In one of the most famous passages from Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says in a parable, Whatever you did for one of these least of mine, you did for me. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. So on the street, someone asks you for change. What's the answer? Often the people we meet on the street, whether they really need our assistance or not, they're they're sort of looking for attention, somebody to listen to them. And uh, that's often how I I start the process off. And from there, uh, sometimes some interesting things can happen. Welcome to The Faithful Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Ganser. In this episode, we'll take a few moments to explore the Christian response to people panhandling for money, either out of legitimate need or, as we'll hear, not so legitimate need. There may not be a perfect answer, but we'll get some perspective from the head of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in the Diocese of Cleveland, Gary Soule. That's in this episode of Faithful. When you really think about the Gospel of Matthew and what Jesus says about the least of these, there's no waffling here. These are what are called the corporal acts of mercy, which the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says are found in the teachings of Jesus and give us a model for how we should treat all others as if they were Christ in disguise. But Does this mean if someone walks up to me, I need to give money every time? When working in European city centers or downtown Phoenix or Cleveland, I would always try to have some food and offer that instead of money. But is it enough? The U.S. Catholic bishops say giving alms to the poor is best done this way. Donate money to organizations that have the ability to provide support and services for those in need. Do research and find organizations that put people in need first rather than profit. And that seems totally sensible. And yet, when I'm approached on the street, I feel faced with a flesh-and-blood person asking me for help. But do they really need help? One reason I'm so torn on this is probably because of the effect of local TV news. The spirit of giving. But there is a group of panhandlers targeting some areas who may not be as needy as you think. CBS 2 investigative reporter David Goldstein took his hidden cameras to find out. All holding signs claiming to be down and out. But are they as needy as they seem? You're driving a rental car? Maybe not. I lived in Phoenix years ago, and homelessness was a year-round issue, but with a noticeable increase in the winter months around the holidays. In the summer, people literally die from desert temperatures above 100, 110, 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Phoenix is on pace for a record-breaking number of homeless deaths. According to new data from the Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office, more than 300 homeless people have already died this year. And experts say the increase isn't a surprise. Team 12's Michael Downa talked with advocates and a person who knows the conditions all too well. Back to normal. But in the winter, temperatures were moderate, and freeway off-ramps would have people with signs asking for money. And I wanted to help, but then I saw on TV a report similar to these. It's natural to want to help people like this man or this woman begging by a road in Salt Lake City. Her sign says she's stranded in need of help, trying to get home. When drivers stop, she tells them, I'm from Seattle. I came down here to live with my boyfriend, and he ended up kicking me out a week before Christmas. You got nothing then? Just my backpack. 
but then the cameraman quietly followed her and found she actually lives just two blocks away in this house. You have to remember, charity is one of the really obvious activities for Christians. All throughout the Bible, Jesus tells us in one way or another to help the less fortunate. Do I have a Christian duty to give money no matter what? Am I doing more harm than good? If I try to do good without checking for potential harm? In Phoenix, I ultimately began constructing backpacks that I would keep in the trunk of my car or in the back seat. And in each backpack, I would stuff canned fruit or snacks or survival tools like a flashlight or matches, a Bible, and information about the largest homeless shelter in the area. Things that I think I would appreciate if I were having a serious rough patch. I would only give the packs to people I had seen before and who seemed to be legitimately in need. But with stories of scammers, my charity was poisoned to a degree with skepticism. In scripture, Galatians chapter 6, we find the line, Bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. To continue exploring the question of right action in the face of maybe unknown need, we're joined by Gary Soule, the CEO of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in the Diocese of Cleveland. It's a tremendous ministry that is run mostly by volunteers, about 2,000 of them, focused on giving person-to-person -person support, nearly 200,000 people getting food support or visits from volunteers. Whether it's nourishing food at our hunger centers, providing homeless families with warm clothing, beds and mattresses, blankets for the homeless, eviction prevention, school supplies, utilities, and more. Because our episode today is about finding the Christian response to someone asking for help, I thought the Society of St. Vincent de Paul was the perfect place to go for advice. Here's CEO Gary Soule. I find it very helpful to talk to the person. So often the people we meet on the street, whether they really need our assistance or not, they're, they're sort of looking for attention, somebody to listen to them. And uh, that's often how I, I start the process off. And from there, uh, sometimes some interesting things can happen depending on, on exactly what maybe their motives are and what they're, where they're at that day. That's really good. Really, it comes down to connecting to the person. It's not so much about the material aid, which is important, but really we need to make a connection, right? Absolutely. And, and a lot of people are surprised. They don't really expect us to do that. They almost get used to us wanting to just give them some money or just say no and walk away. Mm. Um, so this idea of almsgiving in general, uh, if you go to the USCCB, the Catholic bishops of the United States, they say to vet a you know, established charity or ministry. Um, and that's kind of the best place uh, to give. Um, again, it gets into this tension, though. Uh, if we're facing a, a person on the street, this is a human being in front of us asking for help. Um, so how do we weigh or do you have any tips on weighing, giving to a great organization like yourself, uh, but also, you know, being a person with another human being? Well, I think we're always going to bump into people on the street, Tony, who are going to ask us for assistance. And some of it he has to do with what they're asking for. I won't say so much how they ask, but what they're asking for. Um, and then maybe the dialogue that you have with them. Um, sometimes they'll walk away. Mm. So that uh, it, it sort of tells me that that really they were just looking to get some money. Um, and then some of it, because I'm with St. Vincent de Paul, some of it he has, uh, and I'll share this with you because it's, it's not a bad thing to know if you're in, in certain areas and you do notice you're getting asked for money. Um, for instance, if I'm over on West 25th Street by the West Side Market, we have a large operation at St. Pat's right down the street at West 36th. 
I'll direct people to St. Pat's. I'm, I'm proud of our food pantry and we do hot meals there twice a week. I'm proud of the people who work there. They're, they assist people and they're very familiar with the neighborhood and so forth. So I often direct people to uh, one of our locations if I'm near any of them. I, I, I frequent all of them, uh, but throughout the eight counties of the Cleveland Diocese, I'll direct people to St. Vincent de Paul. Hmm. It's it's really a value add when you think about it. It's not just a transaction on the street, but really you're trying to, you know, further a connection with somebody and bring them to to a little more robust support. Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this now is because, you know, around the holidays, we we often kind of get this push for charity and giving. Uh, but I heard long ago that, honestly, it's the times other than the holidays where there is a great need and we should be thinking about charity and, and community service all year round. And I thought I'd just uh, pose that to you. Is that an accurate kind of uh, imbalance, I guess, in in our focus on, on helping others? It's a 24-7, 365 days a year kind of a need. The um, what is interesting is is the conversations you can get into with some of the people. Uh, some of them are pretty interesting. Some of them are very honest, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are just uh, maybe they're uh, having a rough day. In other cases, uh, they really need the help. That's that's how they they get by. We we say so much about the material aid, but looking at someone and, and giving them the dignity that they are a human, uh, mm -hmm. it does go a long way because we're also called to do that in our faith. Tony, I was thinking about this, if I may. I once had a gentleman ask us, he was at the back door of our pantry on uh, Archwood and West 25th. And he asked me for, he asked me for something very specific and that was the car fare so he could get back to the east side. Mm -hmm. His apartment was from the east side. And he shared with me that he'd just been recently released from jail. And so he'd served about 14 years because I did some prison ministry. So I asked him a little bit about, uh, you know, where he served and things like that. Not Nothing about why, just where he'd served, what he'd done. And so after listening to this gentleman for a little while, I gave him what some might consider actually to be a large sum of money. And he looked at it and he looked at me and he was a little stunned. And uh, he thanked me and he went to walk away. And as he walked away, I said to him, I said, you know, I just wonder, I said, now that you've been released uh, and you share with me that you have family out there that you're hoping to reconnect with, you could be a great resource for them uh, so that they understand uh, what it was like for you. I says, and I want to just share with you now that you're out and you're going to have to reestablish your life, keep in mind that God puts you here for a reason. Mm. And I stopped him cold in his tracks. And I've often wondered what happened to the gentleman. Okay. Because as I said, he was out from the east side and I did not ever see him again. But uh, well, I helped him out with his car fare, but I don't always help everyone. Just yeah. so your listeners are aware, I can't always do that. So. That's a that's a beautiful story. And really thinking about it through that lens, someone who made maybe not the greatest choice in their past is being given an opportunity to make a better choice now. And you're just reminding them that now's an opportunity to choose. Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, that's that's great. You know, one thing. Um, that looking through some of the materials about uh, St. Vincent de Paul is I saw through COVID, which was such a strange time, and it, it still feels like a strange time, uh, that the number of volunteers fell uh, who were helping out with your ministry, but the hours actually increased. And I thought that was really interesting in the numbers because I just, I don't understand if people were just giving that much more, like the really dedicated volunteers were just investing themselves even more uh, because we saw so many, you know, uh, food banks and just um, community solidarity around uh, so many different things. Um, was there anything that comes to mind to explain that, that rise in hours? Um, or was it just that? 
doubling down on the ministry? So it was an interesting thing to watch when COVID happened. So the volunteers fell off by, and this will be startling to you, but somewhere between 75 and 80% of the volunteers stopped wow. coming. Okay. Yeah. And that was, some of it had to do with a lot of our volunteers are older, not super old, but older. Sure. Some of them had some health issues. When, of course, it was being recommended that they not, not be in crowds of people, not be around others if they can avoid it. But there was just also a number of people, I think, who were uncomfortable and, and stopped volunteering. What happened, though, was, was we came across a handful of volunteers who were relentless. Mm. They filled all the, all the days of the week that we were open. They It, it happened at not just pantries I'm familiar with, but other pantries um, that I'm aware of that are out there. Uh, people who would normally say work on if the pantry is open twice a, a week, who would work on, on the first day it's open, they were coming both days. Wow. And the other thing people did was it was consistent. It was to the point that when I would walk onto one of the pantry's premises, I knew all the volunteers who were there because they were the same volunteers who were always there during COVID. And that's why you saw the hours go through the roof, but but the volunteer, the number of volunteers went down significantly. Yeah, that's what was going on. And we had an awful lot of dedicated people who came year round and um, it was great. It was great. That's beautiful. At the time, we needed it the most. You really did see people, you know, step up and, and yeah, invest themselves in the faith and also your ministry specifically. Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, just lastly, I, I wonder if, for someone especially who maybe isn't as familiar with the work of uh, St. Vincent de Paul, what do you think they should know? Or what is something that, that they should take with them or consider either if they're faced with one of these uh, you know, choices on the street uh, or just in general as we walk the pilgrim journey? So when, when St. Vincent Paul helps a family, and a family could be defined as, as one or more persons, um, we start out normally by praying with them, okay? So we don't necessarily do that at a food pantry, but anytime we're doing any type of one-on-one -on -one service, we'll start out, we always ask if they're, if they're all right with doing a short prayer. But then the next element that St. Vincent Paul enforces, and I think it, it really makes us different, it has to do with talking and listening to the individual. Okay, things could, that can be a real game changer in in what we do. And then the last piece, of course, is trying to put together the help. And I'll share with you, Tony, that sometimes that help comes from a multiple group of agencies and and people, depending on what exactly is uh, involved and what what's going on. Hmm. So uh, that's what St. Vincent de Paul is all about. That's great. You're you're a link in the chain, uh, and you're that's keeping exactly faith at the center. Are. Yeah. That's exactly what we are, link in the chain. Yeah. <laughs> My thanks to Gary Soule of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in the Diocese of Cleveland. I think many of us want to do the right thing for our neighbors in need, and for someone who is facing addiction for example money may not be the right thing for them but no matter the situation we can and should always recognize others as our brothers and sisters in christ we're all made in the image and likeness of god and that's the case whether we're having a lot of positive momentum in our lives or we're struggling financially physically mentally or spiritually God bless you. Thank you for listening and sharing, faithful, and please have a great day.